Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining me and in these daily devotionals. Um, here it is, Monday, May 15th. We're halfway through the month of May, and um, we're really uh, experiencing spring in the Pacific Northwest, um, which is kind of an interesting time of year because, we, as we always say, if you don't like the weather, wait a second. Uh, so it's a time of real changeable temperatures, and it can be clear, it can be rainy, it can be cloudy. In fact, to be quite honest, our summer really doesn't start until after the 4th of July. I keep on telling myself that because many times people look at May and June and are excited about the summer weather and I find that probably 9 out of 10 times it will rain on the 4th of July here in Spokane and then the weather very cleans up and we, we tend to have summer go all the way through September and sometimes even into October but this is a time of year where those of us who live here try to soak up as much vitamin D as we can by getting out in the sun and experiencing its luxurious warmth as much as we can. At least that's my gig. And, uh, you know, people say, aren't you afraid that it's going to make your skin age? Um, no, my skin is managing to age all on its own. It doesn't need any help from the sun. And uh, I hope it will help me to stay healthier and stronger. Anyway, forgive my uh, commentary. But here we are in, in the middle of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, and Paul has been talking at length about um, about the widows. And it's kind of interesting. I, I gave an explanation last week about why he would do this. And again, for those of you who weren't with us, the issue was that uh, people's lives were relatively short and uh, widowhood was a fairly common experience. Uh, oftentimes because women would be at home where literally life tended to be safer and men would be out in the marketplace or laboring where there weren't a lot of safety precautions and the idea of getting injured or even killed, uh, the possibility was much, much higher for men. And generally, they tended to live a shorter lifespan than did the women. So you had a lot of women who were left uh, without uh, a husband to care for them and provide for them. <coughs> and so what Paul's instructions are is that basically... Um, the family should take on the responsibility to care for their elderly family members, whether they are widows or not. Anyone who is in a position where they couldn't support themselves would become the responsibility of the family. It's interesting to me that in many countries in the third world, that still is the mindset because they don't have the social structure that we have here in America. And I'm not absolutely certain that we're better off for it because one of the things that I find most common in talking with elderly people is they are incredibly lonely because they live maybe comfortably in their own home, but what they lack is interaction with other people. And for many of us who have elderly families, we know that there's a real challenge because of the busyness of our life, and it's hard to give them that kind of attention. But it's something I think is, is really worthwhile, and it's a, an honorable thing to do. Um, and part of the reason that Paul brings it up so much and spends so much time in chapter 5 is because there is a tendency for people who aren't obedient to Christ and aren't submitted to the will of God and maybe haven't been raised with a good tradition, um, they can be very greedy and uh, they can find ways of getting around the responsibility. In fact, Jesus made reference to that in Mark's gospel in chapter 7 when he was chiding the Pharisees because he said, uh, you say that if anyone declares that what, that what might have been used to help their father or their mother is Corban, and then it adds in parentheses, that is devoted to God. Now, this was an interesting device used by some of the religious people in those days. If they had resources, they said, well, I dedicate everything I own to God, and so therefore when I die, all of my wealth, uh, properties, and everything will go to the temple and serve the, the work of God. And that also means, therefore, that I can't use those resources to alleviate the poverty of other people. And it was really just kind of like a, a legal uh, a contrivance to get out of the responsibility of having care for the parents because even though they had dedicated the temple, they were still using it in a dedicated way to their own support and livelihood and enjoyment and pleasures. So it was just a way of escaping the responsibility. And this is why Paul says in, in verse 7, he says, Give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, 
and especially for his immediate family, uh, he, he, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, there's a couple of things here I think are, are real notable. First and foremost, uh, there's a certain equality in the instruction that's given. And I say that because sometimes people feel like, well, because of my position or my responsibility or my role or my title, uh, I'm not responsible for these things. I'm, I'm too engaged, too busy. I'm doing too many important things to be burdened by those sorts of things. But this is for everyone, and it's applied to everyone equally, that we could never think that we are are excused from responsibility to care for our family members, those who are, are included in our, in our nuclear family. And the nuclear family is a concept that was created by God, and it's interesting that there's a move today to eliminate the nuclear fa family. In fact, uh, Black Lives Matter had stated in their website for a long time until too many people pointed it out, and then they removed it, but I don't think it, they removed the concept from their philosophy. And that is that the nuclear family somehow is this unhealthy thing, and we should break that down and, and create uh, what they call chosen families, that I choose the people I want to have in my family. And uh, it's an interesting contrivance because what God basically says is the bond of genetic blood is, is real and is something that should be sustained and maintained, and God will hold you responsible to do that. So the idea that everyone is equal in their responsibility is really kind of a very unique American and, and Christian concept. When the, when the pilgrims came to Plymouth Island, they drew up this compact, this basically this constitution between themselves, which in many ways, uh, according to uh, John Quincy Adams in 1805, he said this was really the, the primary format upon which our American constitution was based. And it's the idea that we are are all equal. Now, the word equal has been kind of uh, jimmied with, and they've kind of replaced it or tried to replace it with the word equity as if they are similar words or the same word. Well, equality means equal opportunity based upon what we would call meritocracy, your merit, what you do, that uh, you can go as far as you want in your life. You can achieve as much as you want. And the idea is that when there's equality, there's a, a level playing field that the color of your skin, the the uh, the gender, the, how tall you are, anything, are not factors in determining how successful you can become. If you're the best athlete, you will be able to participate on the highest levels and be rewarded accordingly. And that's an equality of opportunity. And it's really an important concept socially because what it does is it causes the culture to always strive to improve itself and, and to raise up its standards of excellence and performance and quality and everything else of that nature. But equity just basically means you have an equal outcome. And equity is what the communists use. Uh, I saw the outcome of that in my many trips to Russia, that basically the idea is that your rewards are, are basically an endowment. I'm going to give you a certain amount of money. It's what is recalled called today as a universal guaranteed income. You don't Whether you work hard or you don't work hard doesn't really matter because you're gonna get the same amount of money. Well, what that had to do, what that did in, in many communist countries is just obviously lowered people's initiative and you found that they didn't really try that hard to, to improve themselves. And so the idea is it creates a real inequality that if I do a better job, I'm not going to get rewarded for having done a better job. And so most people end up not doing a better job. They do just enough to get by. The idea of equity is really one of those concepts that's promoted by people who uh, either haven't lived long enough to know how it works or else they're just a naivete about human life and they themselves are finding an excuse from having, or from having to work hard. But this is one of the things he says, give these people these instructions so that nobody will open be blamed. This is something for everybody, whether you're the, the, the leader of the organization or you're at the bottom of the organization. These are responsibilities that are incumbent on every single one of them. And that's why, secondly, what he really establishes the idea is that family is first. That I grew up in a, in a philosophy of ministry as a young Christian where we were told that God first and then ministry or the church or your mission, and then finally in third place was your family. 
And that very philosophy really informed a lot of churches and ministries and a lot of mission organizations. In fact, many mission organizations commonly had mission schools for the kids to go to so that the parents could be free to serve on the mission field. And it had some really uh, unfortunate uh, consequences. But as I see, we're kind of out of time, so I'll bring it to a close here. But we'll pick up this conversation tomorrow. Uh, God bless you. Hope you're having good weather where you are. Go in His grace.